We're coming to a, uh, uh, the close of the, of the conference. Annette, uh, Professor Annette, is going to just tie it all together for us, and uh, and then we'll have closing remarks, and we'll be on the deck. So, uh, Professor Annette, we uh, welcome you up to close. I'll be brief. I know the drinks are calling, <laughs> and you deserve it, having stayed uh, through the day. But um, I want to start by saying. Thank you to everyone who's come along. Um, you've had an amazing array of speakers, um, and it's included people from industry, from unions, from mental health services, from research, from academia, social services. Um, but uh, I think a particularly strong contribution has come from those people who've spoken of their l lived experience, and that's a very powerful message, and I go back to what I said this morning. We need those um, visible champions. So thank you all very much. Um, I, we've heard this afternoon about the economic costs, and uh, Alan, I think it was, said that when he spoke to bankers, they reacted to some, pic some particular statistics. And um, I found that there are a couple of things that I say to people, the industry leaders, the company men, would actually make a difference. And one of them is something that I understand, but lots of people in business don't, and that is that we lose more work days to depression than low back pain. That always seems to make a difference to people. And there's a study that came out in, in the UK at the end of last year, and, and I always quote this because the figures are simple to remember, but that it was that 70 million work days are lost to mental health problems every year at a cost of 70 billion to 100 billion pounds, and that's just a little bit under 5% of GDP. And that's inc that really resonates with the bankers. Um, we've also uh, heard today that 60 per to 70% of people with common mental disorders um, are at work. And uh, Tony talked about uh, his experience. Um, and so it makes sense, it seems to me it's blindingly clear that we keep them working, not only for their personal health, but also it's important economically for the company for which and the industry for which they're working. And it's very clear that if you get well-being right, the industry does get a return. The Mars company, confectionery company, the people who make Mars bars in the UK introduced a well-being program and, in, and reduced their sick days to virtually nothing. We've just talked about the cost of lost productivity with, sick, with absenteeism. Um, and not only that, they engendered and they gained massive employee loyalty. Um, so it pays off. So there are sound moral and economic reasons um, for employers to invest in their workers' mental health. And what we've also learned, and thanks to Chris, is that in contrast to the massive costs of absenteeism because of mental health problems, if we introduce relatively small, relatively cheap in terms of time and money, interventions such as mates um, in construction, it can have quite dramatic um, impacts on employee mental health, on their well-being, and on, and on performance. But to do this, you actually need a culture change. And it needs to be, and Annette refer the other Annette referred to this, it needs to be systemic, it needs to be sustained, it needs to be embedded. We've gone past the point where, where a gesture is acceptable. We can't say anymore, oh, we had mental health week last week, that's it, for another year. Um, it's, it's not acceptable to do that anymore. It's got to be a sustained program. And it's clear that what's going to be most effective is, as I said, a systems change and that you build mental health support into core workplace practices. It's got to be you need a guy at the top who's a systems man. It's got to be a top-down model. The US Air Force model's been referred to a number of times today. It worked because the guy at the top said, I'm taking responsibility for suicide prevention. He also said, today's Tuesday, and I want a suicide prevention plan for the US Air Force on Friday. We take 18 months to develop national suicide prevention programs. It actually took them two weeks, but they got a program. And he said, I'm taking responsibility, and all you guys are going to take responsibility for your areas. And he demonstrated leadership. 
And that's important, and that's really important, and it's why it's so great to see uh, industry and union uh, leaders here today. Um, if, if they model support, um, that will is much more likely to see um, uh, programs uh, taken up by all levels of the workforce. Um, uh, the, the other point that's important is that the programs, workplace programs, are most important, are, are most likely to be effective if we have as many as possible em employees exposed to them doing the program, and if we establish that they're going to be delivered on a regular basis. John's an educator, he knows that impact diminishes over time. So that's why um, you, we need it to be embedded and sustained and in a, delivered in a sustained fashion. The other point that's worth remembering is that there are collateral gains. In the US Air Force, not only did they decrease suicides by 33%, but they also decreased deaths, accidental deaths, they decreased domestic violence incidents, um, they decreased um, other uh, problems, uh, social service problems. So it has wider impact, as you would expect it to. Um, the, uh, we've gone along for a number of years um, being reactive and taking, having to take the opportunities and leverage the opportunities that have been provided. So, you know, typically someone will ring me up and say, uh, I, I manage a, fishery, a fisheries company and I've got a ship coming in. Um, There's a guy, we knew he had some problems, the ship went out, he jumped overboard, they spent a couple of hours looking for him, but we've lost him. The ship's coming in, it's due in, back in port in an hour or so, I need you to send someone. So that's the sort of reactive, and then we go in later and we do a program. Or, I've had so many of these calls, we get someone saying, it's Friday, we've just had morning tea, and the secretary's son died by suicide, and she's been off work for two weeks, uh, but she's coming back on Monday, and no one knows what to say to her. Can you send someone round at lunchtime to talk to us? So we've leveraged those opportunities because that's the only um, entree we've had um, into companies and into industry in the past. But now I think we have a model with mates where we can be proactive and we can implement programs before we get to the suicide. Um, the one of the final points I want to make is that making well-being and suicide prevention, health and safety priority is a goal whose time has come. I think that in five years' time, uh, employers who have not implemented these types of programs will be seen as being out of touch. Um, that work safety um, will it does now, but it will more so in five years' time include uh, well-being and suicide prevention. Uh, another point I think is worth making is that workplaces, what we've learned, um, is that workplaces are well situated to disseminate public health messages. Who would have thought 20 years ago that smoking cessation would work, that we'd actually have workplaces um, where you can't smoke, you can't smoke outside either. Um, but, but I think that that's um, a model and an example of how you can disseminate a public health program in the workplace because that's where you access most people. Um, I never would have thought five or ten years ago that leadership in suicide prevention in the workplaces would have come from the construction industry. Congratulations. But I think as one of the um, panel members said, we have to keep the momentum going. Um, and over the time that I've been working in this sort of social service, mental health area, I've seen cycles where various issues have dominated funding, got the funding, dominated policy. And it's gone from childhood sexual abuse to a focus on domestic violence and interpersonal violence to a focus on youth suicide. And I fear we're going to have a focus on obesity because it's such a, a big problem that it's going to soak up uh, some of the funding that might be available uh, for suicide prevention. So, uh, final words: uh, don't lose the gains that have we that we've been, that we've made so far. Thank you all very much for coming along. Thank you, Annette. She's done a great job, hasn't she? Just connecting it all up. Give her another hand. <laughs>